Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. The sun is bright and warm, safely away from the busy city streets. Along the shoreline, people walk or run. Some choose to head down the bluff to the shore itself and enjoy the cool, salty waters of the Straits of Juan de Fuca, watching a passing sea lion or bird or boat or ship. Some push their bodies to the limits, running or jogging full speed, burning calories and enjoying the feeling of movement as rubber sole hits tarred pavement in a rhythmic ritual as the landscape passes through their vision as a blur. Some stroll casually along the path, enjoying the scent of the flowers and the sea air, mindfully taking in the beauty of the coastline. They push walkers or strollers or wheelchairs. They talk with friends. They listen to their personal stereos, alone in the crowd. They pursue these various activities in orderly fashion, yielding for the quickest among them in choreographed movements that belie their happenstance. Like good members of the community, most do not stray from the paths provided. That is, most of the two-legged creatures stay on the path. Dallas Road is a dog haven. On any summer afternoon or evening, dogs happily run, fetch, drool, swim, roll on their backs, and check out every smell they possibly can find. Some of them stay close to their human companions. Others run freely, happy to let out their inner wolves to roam the bluffs. While some are more shy than others, all of them seem quite pleased to be out in the sun, doing what comes naturally. Originally, we approached several dogs and their human companions to see if we could record some barking and panting noises to add as background for our show. What we ended up recording was a wonderful collection of human-dog interaction. Hi! Hi! Boy, you're a big guy. Yes, you are. I <laughs> mean, eat the mic. <laughs> I, get her, I get her going here. Hey, baby! <laughs> <laughs> you talk to me? What do you say? Hey, what princess. Do say? What do you say? Speak. Princess, speak. Speak. <laughs> Come on. Speak. Speak. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you good talk. Oh, she's got a great voice that she'll uh, talk to you. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Uh-oh, jealousy. So is this Prince? 
<laughs> so Alexis. Hey. Hey. <laughs> what did you say? Did you talk to me? Did you talk to me? Yeah. She howls, but only on a cake. <laughs> <laughs> What do you say? It's too hot to do this, say? isn't it? What do you say? What do you say? Yes, you're a good girl. Hey, what's your name? Morgan. Morgan. Morgan! Oh, I know. She had a cookie she would buy. Well, I have a cookie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, she likes that. <laughs> Morgan, sit. Morgan, sit. Good girl. You wait a sec. You're gonna do a good, good bark. Oh. Here. <laughs> Look. We'll take her a minute, but she'll eventually bark. <laughs> She's very well behaved, dog. <laughs> She's trying to hold it in. <laughs> Come on, Morgan, let her rip. Look, it's really yummy. I mean, Boy, that, that looks good. Maybe she won't. The dog wouldn't bark. <laughs> but you guys did a good job for her. Come on, Morgie, bark. She seems well mannered, at least. If you say speak, will she speak? No, I don't train her to bark. <laughs> Something I try to get her not to do, usually. Okay. <laughs> and you hand it works. <laughs> oh, 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 good girl, Mark. She does a real good bark. Sometimes. Oh. 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 Come on. Oh, that's good enough. I can't frustrate her anymore okay. with a cookie. Make it, make it nice. Come here, Dexter. Dexter. Cookies. <laughs> Is that the magic word? Was that the magic word? Walking cookies. Yeah. So said there's no cookie. Can you talk to me? Yes, no. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> you know, all these movie star types that are just... <laughs> yeah, he needed his contract signed first, huh? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye, Dexter. <laughs> Where's Pussycat? Where's Pussycat? Boy, that was a good bark. It's supposed to be Natasha when I got her at the SPCA, but we short her. And actually, I don't even often call her that. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm supposed to pick this up and throw it, aren't I? <laughs> I'm not very good at throwing. Whoa! <laughs> There's a doggy. There's a doggy. Where's the big doggy gone? Where? Where's the dog? Where'd he go? It's over there. You go find that doggy. Where is he going? Is that it, Brandy? Got it. <laughs>
You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM, Victoria. Symbolic interactionism is a term coined by sociologist Herbert Bloomer in 1937 and represents one of the major approaches to social phenomena taken by sociologists. According to SI, people attach meanings to things they encounter. Those meanings are created through social interaction. Words and gestures are the means by which people share meanings with each other. People anticipate what others will do based upon those meanings. So, for a symbolic interactionist, words, gestures, and meanings in mundane exchanges merit close study and understanding. Dr. Clint Sanders is a symbolic interactionist. He has been a professor of sociology at the University of Connecticut since 1976. About ten years ago, his career literally went to the dogs. During that time, he has turned his attention to human-dog interactions. This may not be as far-fetched as it seems. He has co-authored one book on sociology of animals, regarding animals, with Arnold Arluk, and another book specifically about dogs, understanding dogs, living and working with canine companions. He has also done research on veterinary practices, and he is currently studying police dogs and their human partners. We talked to him by phone recently and discussed his interest in dogs and his assertion that if we want to understand human society fully, we need to acknowledge that we live in an interspecies society. How long have you been doing research on dogs? Well, since the late 80s, actually. Okay. What I do is ethnography. So I had finished up a large project. I was studying the world surrounding tattooing and wanted to do something completely different and had been had gone to high school in Morristown, New Jersey, and, which is where the a guide dog program is. So I'd seen guide dogs a lot and was kind of interested in that. thought I would study guide dogs, but when I kind of stuck a toe in there, I realized I didn't know enough about dogs generally. So I just happened to have gotten two puppies and started uh, going with them to a puppy kindergarten. Uh, okay, what's a puppy so, kindergarten? <laughs> <laughs> a puppy kindergarten is what all new d uh, dog owners should do, which is you go with a bunch of other people with puppies, and the puppies get used to other dogs and getting handled, and they learn some basic kinds of commands. So it's really a very good socializing thing for them. So both the owner and the dog go to kindergarten together? Yes. Ah. So it's good for everybody. Did you find any other sociologists doing this work when you first started getting into it? When I first got into it, there were probably, oh, at most two other sociologists who were doing it. Uh, there were a lot of people from other fields, principally psychology. Psy psychologists have been doing it for a while because um, much of the human-animal interaction stuff started with people who were interested in the therapeutic use of pets. Sure. There was, even at that time, a, a, there, there were international meetings on human-animal interaction and things like that, but not many sociologists, no. Since you've been getting into it, have you found that it's, is this an up-and-coming thing? Are there more sociologists getting involved? More sociologists every day, um, despite the fact that it's it continues to be somewhat controversial. Um, a well-known organizational sociologist in one of the journals called the interest in animals a boutique issue within sociology, <laughs> which irritated many of us, as you might imagine. Yes. Um, but there is now, in the American Sociological Association, a section on um, animals and society. Oh, interesting. I didn't realize that. There's a, a lot more interest. All the professional meetings have sessions. Uh, there are, are two major journals that have uh, social scientists who do this kind of work. 
give me an idea of what the topics are that get addressed in this kind of work. I mean, I, you mentioned guide dogs before. I imagine it's a little bit richer than one might think at first. The people doing a variety of different things. Some people come at it out of an interest in social movements. Hmm. So there are studies of the animal rights movement, for example. Sure. Other people are interested in uh, interactions with wildlife or understanding of wildlife, how wildlife is constructed. So there are some people doing that kind of thing. There's a great book by a, a guy named Rick Scarce called Fishy Business about how <laughs> wildlife scientists construct the salmon. People oh. are doing work on the relationship between violence and uh, violence to animals and violence to people. That's become a very hot topic these days. Yeah, I actually have heard that cited in more popular places, like I've heard it talked about on CNN and yeah. places like that. The kinds of things I'm interested in are, are much more oh, kind of traditionally sociological in a sense. I'm a symbolic interactionist, so I'm mm -hmm. interested in you know how people operate face-to-face. -face. And so what I've the kind of work I've been doing is how people develop relationships, social relationships with, with animals, particularly dogs. In your observations and in your reports, do you report on the dog behavior as well as the human behavior? Yeah, it's, in that it's an interaction, I'm interested in the behavior of both the major parties. Mm -hmm. I've done work with kind of everyday dog owners, and I've done studies of, uh, I, I did a study of a guide dog training program, and I spent over a year doing field work in a um, veterinary clinic. So I, I became very interested in veterinarians. Oh, that's an interesting thought. The but, sick role of the dog. <laughs> yeah, well, many people are doing um, kind of occupational sociology mm -hmm. around animals. Would that include, too, working dogs, the way dogs are used within occupations? Yes, absolutely. There are people doing things on, uh, actually, dogs that, that do real work, like... Uh, like shepherds, dogs, and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, anthropologists have been doing that kind of thing for, for some time now. What do you think sociology brings to the study that would be different from anthropology or psychology? Well, I think at least the kind of sociology that I'm interested in, the kind of sociology that I do, brings knowledge about how interactions actually work in, at a face-to-face -face level. Clearly a part of that is... and kinds of things that I'm interested in and some of the people who, that I work with are interested in is how companion animals come to be defined as virtual people. <laughs> um, the, this category of person is socially applied, is socially defined. Mm -hmm. We take it from some, uh, historically we've taken it from African Americans, for example, as slaves, mm -hmm. um, and then it, it's given back to them. So I'm interested in, in personhood and how that gets assigned in the context of every, everyday interaction with companion animals. And I'm also interested in the concept of mind, how we come to understand what's going on in the head of other beings. There, there's a lot of how we understand what's going on with our human associates, but not too much about how we understand what's going on with uh, beings that can't talk to us using language, at least. This whole idea of mind traditionally within sociology is something that's it's kind of this internal conversation you know it's a, it's a linguistic activity so mind becomes a really interesting type of thing to think about when you're thinking about beings that don't have a language how do they think do you think that it matters whether or not we guess right in the interaction i mean are you looking for the accuracy of how well we understand dogs or are you looking more at how human behavior is affected by what, by what we believe we understand? Mm -hmm. I think in all social interaction, we, in, in our interactions with other human beings, mm -hmm. we make guesses, more or less good guesses, about what's going on with the other person. And then we you know, make decisions about how to behave based on that. And that gets thrown back and forth. Sometimes when we have problems in interaction, it's because uh, that, that process fouls up in some way or another. We 
do the same thing when we, we interact with, with the animals that share our lives. Sometimes we do it appropriately. Sometimes we don't. I think one of the problems in the relationship between people and the, their animals that live with them is that they, they don't have a very good understanding of how those animals, how those kinds of beings think. Mm -hmm. And so what we have a tendency to do, understandably, is fall back on thinking about them as like small, furry human beings <laughs> that are not really too bright. <laughs> and I, yep. I think that's generally a mistake, and I think that really does a disservice to dogs and cats and these other animals that we live with, because they aren't small human beings. They, they are, in fact, animals, and if, and if we understand them from that perspective, then that relationship is going to go much better. But what that relationship, like all relationships, eventually comes down to is a very practical thing, what works over time. Mm -hmm. And I come, I, I, I live with Newfoundlands. I know them as individuals, and I know how they are going to respond to the situations we find ourselves in together. And I know how to deal with them in a, on a day-to-day -day basis, given the kinds of situations we're in. And I know that because it works. You know, I might be wrong about what's going on in their heads, but when it really comes down to it, it's a, it's a practical kind of process. Right. So we're looking, you're looking more, not so much to really know what's going on in the minds of either the animal or the person, but rather you're looking at the interaction. And, and that interaction is, is, is interesting and worthwhile to look at because it makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, I, I always think of interaction as a kind of dance. And, you know, if we if in that dance of interaction we keep stepping on each other's feet, then, <laughs> then something's wrong. Yeah, and I, I giggle in part because that's my cat's way of communicating that she wants to be fed. She steps on my feet. Yeah. <laughs> See, but that's, that's what always is amazing to me when I talk to other sociologists about the work I do, because uh, they say, well, you know, they, they think, a lot of people in, within sociology think that the, the kind of relationship people have with companion animals is very much like the relationship they have with oh, their, their car, their computer. <laughs> you know, it's, they, you give it a name and you kind of think that it's being belligerent or, you know, acting right or like that, but it, it's still just this thing. Yeah. And um, that, that really goes against the experience of most people in this society who actually live with animals. Mm -hmm. And that, that is most people. I mean... You know, people say, why do you study people's relationships with animals? Well, because animals live in over 60% of the households in the wow. society. It makes a lot of sense for us to study that. Yeah, I, I read uh, on Yukon's website in a press release about your uh, book that came out in 99 mm -hmm. that you suggested we live in an interspecies society. I thought that was a very astute uh, observation that, you know, how we define society in human terms is not exactly accurate. Oh, exactly. I was also excited to find out that you were doing this work. I, I can recall in my own sociology classes, especially in discussions about symbolic interactionism and micro-level interactions, somebody always brings up uh, in discussing how we d construct the other about how people talk to their dogs or their, their cats and actually give them words. Right. And I have always heard this as an example of how we sort of anticipate each other in social interactions. And uh, and yet everybody just sort of blows it off two seconds later as a serious study. And uh, I would always think, gee, that would be so cool to uh, to really take a look at that. Because, it's, because I know as a pet owner, and I've owned uh, dogs and cats, and even birds, um, I give them all sorts of uh, anthropomorphic qualities that I doubt very seriously they're seeing it exactly as I am. But I talk for them all the time, you know. Yeah, in in uh, both of my books, uh, I have one book called uh, Regarding Animals with Arnold R. Luke at Northeastern. Mm -hmm. And there's a chapter in that on what, I, what we call speaking for, speaking for <laughs> animals. And there's, I mean, that's a, an overt 
example of how people try to understand what's going on in the minds of their animals. They, they give voice to the experience of their animals. And any, anyone who's a parent and has had an infant knows what that process is about. You mentioned that uh, some people in sociology have called this a, a boutique. Is that what you called it, a boutique uh, yeah, study? Yeah, boutique issue. Uh, yeah, boutique I, issue. I think that is to differentiate it from the kind of department store issues that sociology <laughs> deals with. <laughs> <laughs> um, give me a sense of why you think these topics would be important to address. I mean, you've, you've mentioned some of the more serious stuff like um, treatment of animals, social movements aspect and everything, but I, I have a sense from what I've read about your work that you also see these more mundane topics as in, important to address. And, and just tell me why. I won't second guess why. Well, I, I think mundane topics in general are important for sociologists to look at because they are what our, our social lives are about. Our social lives aren't about so much about class or about organizational structure or things like that. Our lives, our everyday experience, is about the mundane stuff of everyday life. And I think that it, those things bec- are such commonplace issues for us as sociologists that they come to be denigrated, that we really shouldn't look at these things that are the stuff of everyday life because they're they're just so common and so familiar. But it's those common and familiar things that are really the most interesting, it seems to me. And certainly if so many of us have relationships with animals, then we ought to look at that. I mean, it's, it's really criminal to denigrate looking at something that's so common. Mm-hmm. What have you learned about people in looking at their relationships to animals? Can you... I'm not necessarily asking for big theories here, but just some general things that you might you, you think you might not have learned if you hadn't looked at animals, their relationship to animals. One of the things that keeps coming up as I study people's relationships with animals is is it really fits into the sociology of emotions, and that is the emotional character of the relationships people have with their companion animals, and how they not only understand their animal companions as as having an emotional life, but also their own emotional lives are wrapped up in that. One of the things that I became very interested in was um, uh, when when I was studying the veterinary clinic was interaction that goes uh, around euthanasia. Mm -hmm. And when people are forced to put down these animals that they truly love. And I can remember I, I wrote a paper and I was delivering it at this conference, and it was a fairly large crowd, and I was reading some of the descriptions of people's experiences with euthanasia. And I looked out at the audience, and I I saw all these people crying. That's an indication of how incredibly important this topic is and this relationship is. Yeah. People are are so emotionally bound to these creatures. Yes. There's several books on the market about what we can learn from dogs. <laughs> you have any uh, anything to add to that? What can human beings learn from from our dogs? That's an interesting question. I think <laughs> I think what I've learned from my dogs, and I think what we we as human beings can learn from dogs, is to appreciate really basic things and to live in the present. Um, my dogs, my dogs love a good meal. They get incredibly excited when it's time to go for a walk. Um, and I, I think what what I've learned is that those basic things are really incredibly important, and it, we should, in a sense, cherish those things in the here and now, in the way animals do. Mm-hmm. You're doing some research right now, I think you mentioned to me yesterday, and uh, and are going to be putting together a book soon. You want to tell me a little bit about that? I'm, I'm continuing my interest in people that work with, with dogs. So, I, as I said, I studied guide dog trainers, and I studied um, people who live with guide dogs, and I also studied veterinarians. So I'm, I'm kind of moving from there to... Uh, 
I did some field work with uh, canine police officers in a training program in which they were training their dogs and first met their dogs and then training their dogs. So I'm kind of interested in very intense, dependent relationships between people and, uh, and oh. dogs. Interesting. And I guess in some ways because of the threat to life that goes on, I imagine that there is a kind of bonding there that is a little deeper than uh, than, than just the everyday relationship with the pet. Oh, it's incredibly deep. The, um, the officers that I talked to said, I spend more time with my dog than I spend with any other being, more time with that dog than I spend with my family. And the dog generally lives with them. Mm-hmm. So they say... I, you know, I work with this, with my dog. I live with my dog. Uh, the, the dog is my partner in a, in a real sense. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? I no, I think that we are pretty much covered the field. Here, Great. Very briefly. Well, I very much appreciate your time. It's good to talk to you. Yes, it was good meeting you. You take care. You too. Bye. Bye now. Regular first-person plural listeners will recall the portion of the closing credits of the show that says, All music for first-person plural is composed, performed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson. One of the pieces we have played on the show, entitled Eaten by Sharks, while composed, produced, and largely performed by Carl Wilkerson, does feature a barking dog. The dog in question was a Pekingese that supervised the Wilkerson household for over 10 years in the 1980s and 90s. He was named Puffin, and he made his unwitting contribution to the realm of experimental music in 1987. For those of us who remember him, Puffin was a remarkable little dog. He displayed all the regal bearing normally associated with his breed, while seeing to it himself that his willing subjects were well entertained. Those of us who loved him prefer to remember him as he was in life, noisy and probably unaware of any lack of substantive authority he might convey in the process of being so. Here again, in all his dogged enthusiasm, is Puffin, helping his grateful owner and establishing himself at long last as a work dog and eaten by sharks.
You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvic.ca. Giving sociology an edge! Patty and I have decided to do something a little creative. Now, we're going to do the top ten things that dogs have taught us. Each of us has a list of ten items, and we'll be sharing them with each other for the first time and with you. Patty, would you like to get started? Sure. How are we going to do this? Are we going to start with number ten? Uh, I was going to go one to ten. If you want to go ten to one, go ahead. That'll add variety. I wrote them as ten to one, so... That's fine. Go ahead. All right. So, my number ten... Should we have the drum roll, like, uh, no. with his face? <laughs> no, we shouldn't. A late night television. Brrr. Anyway, number 10. Always make a straight line to the shade, no matter where the streets, sidewalks, or pre-designated paths are. Okay. That's especially good on a summer day. Number 9. Drink water to stay healthy. Number 8. A little bit of sleep during the day improves endurance. Afternoon naps. Number seven, eat. Enjoy eating. Enjoy the taste of food. Enjoy the smell of food. Number six, too much time alone in the house is a bad thing. Fresh air is always good. Number five, it doesn't matter how you get your exercise, just move around and enjoy it. Number four, the simplest toys are the best. Number three, play as hard as you work. In fact, there should be no difference between playing and working. Number two, it is important to protect the little ones. Dogs are very good at that. Yes, they are. And the top thing that dogs have taught me is to enjoy each and every good thing in life with all the gusto you can. Even if you don't know what gusto is. Or you don't know what it is you're enjoying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here are my top th- ten things. I went one to ten because I'm old-fashioned. I've got that ordinal paradigm in my mind, and I can't do anything about it now. Yeah, I it's just, just watched too, too much Letterman, I'll, I'll admit to it. Shh, that's a proprietary word. Oh, I'm sorry. That word does not belong to us. <laughs> number one, take advantage of the natural cover. That matches up with your number ten, coincidentally. Number two, food first. Number three, cleanliness is next to impossible. (laughs) Number four, don't go to sleep. So that's in contrast to your nap one. You don't think, oh, you can't go to sleep if anybody's around. That's right. If If something's happening, it's not sleep time. That's right. If things are happening and you are not involved, you must wake up immediately. Figure out what's going on. Number five, play favorites. (laughs) <laughs> number six don't be ashamed to take a toy to bed number seven drive through restaurants are the pinnacle of human achievement the rationale behind this being that they combine hanging your head out the door <laughs> yes automobile trips and food <laughs> irrevocably number eight cats are like dogs only they're cats which i think sums up the relationship between cats and dogs well enough Number nine, the proper place to sit for meals is at the table. Something that we all forget a little too often in this TV-oriented world. Of course, having the radio on during dinner is uh, optimal, I think. And lunch, for that matter. Number ten, don't hide your love, not even for a moment. Yeah, it wouldn't hard coming up with the top ten list at all. If you could add a number eleven, what would it be? I don't know, I like that last one that you said about love. Dogs are very good at loving unconditionally. Even when they play favorites, they still uh, will not uh, hold much against you. It takes a lot to get a dog mad at you for a long time. I think that's pretty uh, pretty cool. I would add, if I had a, an 11th, it would be, it is not necessarily relevant if the other dog is bigger. <laughs> yeah, that's true. one true. more. We had a Pekingese once who could chase Rottweilers down the street quite well. (laughs) And did so with a little more frequency than perhaps... Was safe. (laughs) Common sense would have dictated. (laughs) 
very brave little dog, but as stupid as a stone. <laughs> he had his moments, but they were uh, momentary. I've often wondered what dogs learn from us. I feel like the socialization process works both ways, that they teach us, we teach them, and there's a sort of symbiosis that's achieved. I know that because the relationship between people and dogs has got such a long history, and I mean, we're talking really long, like tens of thousands of years. I read somewhere that they have that the same diseases, the species are so connected to each other, and this is not true of cats as much as it is of dogs, that because we hang out, the same bugs attack us in the same ways, and we can actually share diseases because of that. If you look at it on a species level, it's somewhat of a symbiotic relationship between the species, but it also has become so interconnected that we actually attract the same germs and have uh, fight off the same diseases and so forth. So, And that doesn't happen often unless species live very much in, clo- in close proximity with each other. It might help here for the sake of being overly intellectual if we defined what we meant by interaction. I would say that the work dogs interact the most measurably with humans. Simply because they obey commands? Sure, it's a lot more palpable than it is with one that's meant to be a house pet. I don't know. I think it's an interaction when the dog refuses to do what you say and refuses to go where you want him to go. <laughs> so all of them interact. But yeah, you're talking about around. measurability, not not defining. Well, am I am I talking? Is, is should measurability be the criterion? I guess that sounds like a, an idiotic question, but I feel like there were things that cropped up in my relationships with dogs that, although not measurable, were quite palpable, and I could rely upon them. But which is, I think, is another test of rigor. It's interesting. In the interview, Clint pointed out that a lot of people, a lot of people, when they're dealing with their animals and this certainly includes dogs, will think of them, I think he used the words, furry little human beings, and and not understand sort of dogdom, if you will. And I've seen trainers talk about this on television before, about how there are certain breeds that are better for certain tasks, and that's because they have bred into them certain in, instinctual ways of dealing with things. For instance, herding dogs are not very good to have in the house around kids because they tend to want to herd the kids. <laughs> and they start this, deciding which side of the room the child should be on. Yeah, and this doesn't always go over well with the kid. <laughs> and and as such, then uh, you, you kind of have a problem because the dog is trained to, to growl and snap. and Well, the dog is bred, I should say to growl and snap and to essentially be what we would interpret as a little bit mean in order to get you to do what it thinks that you should do. Sure, and that's and, and part of that is uh, part of that is actual threat and part of it is symbolic. Yeah. I got play growls out of my dogs all the time when we were in the sure. middle of wrestling over some saliva covered object. <laughs> and they would growl at me, and I could tell the difference between when they were kidding and when they were serious. But little kids can't always I, tell the difference. Sure, I would guess that a kid can't, but dogs understand the difference between play and serious. I, I would love to subject that to some sort of empirical verification. I would love to. Probably somebody has somewhere. They do have particular behaviors that are dog behaviors, that are not, you know, that we interpret through human filters, so to speak, but they really are understandable if you understand the dogs. Animals understand a certain number of words. They're not much on speaking. Oh, actually, I read 200, that the average dog has a vocabulary, understands a vocabulary of around 200 words. That's incredible. Yeah, and so they probably are understanding a little more than we realize. I even got in a couple words of French on my dogs. They weren't crazy about them, but they learned them. The cat knows the petit chat, though. Petit chat? Yeah. She I comes got, running to petit chat now. I got assiette across, and I got... Femme tabouche across. <laughs> and allons-y. He knew he was going for allons-y. a walk. Allons-y. Oui, c'est vrai. <laughs> he knew he was going for a walk. Allons-y he said, allons-y. Yeah, we have a friend who said that uh, he's thinking about only speaking German to his cat when he gets her. I think that's more for the benefit of our friend than of his cat. It's a way of practicing his German. Yes, but on the other hand, I think it brings up the fact that animals don't care whether you're talking to them in English or German or French. They get the point based upon the way you interact with them. 
or they seem to get the point anyway. It's hard to tell. Oh, I have a funny dog story. Okay. Sure. I have to include this. I I got Rogered on an April Fool's Day, um, and, and this is a dog radio story, too. How about that? Better. I was listening to National Public Radio in on April Fool's Day a few years back, and they were interviewing um, several people who supposedly were claiming that they had cracked the dog code and that they actually had figured out what different dog barks meant and had created a computer program that could listen to the dog barks and translate it into English. And I was like, holy cow, I actually bought this for about 10 minutes. I can't believe I was so fooled. It suddenly occurred to me about 10 minutes into the conversation what day it was and that I was, in fact, uh, having my proverbial leg pulled. But in the meantime, they interviewed linguist um, uh, Deborah Tannen, who went into this very elaborate theory that sounded so lucid about how dog uh, language structure had been tapped into. And there was an understanding of what each kind of, of bark meant and how barks were, barking was coupled with gesturing and so forth. And she just sounded so legitimate. And, of course, I recognized the name of the scholar on top of that. And so I'm just sitting there going, oh, isn't this funny? This is so great. But when the translate, and then they would show that they would, do this guy with a translation, right? And you could hear the dog barking, and then you could hear the computer talking in the computer lingo voice saying what the dog had just said. What did the computer voice say? Did they want to take over the world and beat up all the cats or something like that? At first it was believable because the computer voice was saying things like, go outside, go outside, go outside, right? But then the dog asked for ice cream, and then I got suspicious. That's what tipped me off. I was like, right, the dog is like, let's go to the ice cream store. (laughs) I was like, I don't think so. (laughs) I saw a Gary Larson cartoon one time, the guy who drew The Far Side. Yeah. Where this guy had had invented a helmet that when he wore it allowed him to understand what dogs were saying. (laughs) So he put it on, but all they were saying was, hey, 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 hey. hey." (laughs) I know there were times when uh, my dogs looked at me that there was this impression that said, you know, when I get bigger than you, I'm going to eat you. (laughs) I just want you to keep that in mind in the weeks ahead. None of them ever got bigger than me, though. When I grow up, you better watch out. (laughs) You put me in the kennel, I'm going to put you in the home. That's fair. Now, we're doing something that is really interesting in talking and giving words to the dog because people do that all the time. They Anthropomorphizing. Like, yeah, they look at their pets and they, how are you today? And then they answer in a, in a made-up voice. And they have entire, I mean, I've had entire conversations with cats and dogs in which I'm doing vo- both voices. <laughs> and there's kind of ventriloquism going on. <laughs> I wouldn't admit that to anyone else if I were you. Oh, I just admitted it on the radio. What can I tell you? Uh, whoops. But it makes you wonder how much we do that with human beings, you know, how much how much our interaction is just in our head. We think that we know what we're saying, and we think that they know. We think they think the same thing that we think, but it may not be true. But they interact, bottom line. They try to pick up on our cues. Even the, even cats who try to give the impression they don't especially care what we think try to pick up on our cues. Yeah. They watch us until we watch them back, and then they turn away and try to act casual. <laughs> but that's that's communication and that's interaction ipso facto. Except our current cat. She's very good at staring. She can uh, make you feel guilty with one look. <laughs> I'd like to make one modification on your list. Uh-oh. You said uh, on... Point number four, the simplest toys. What was it again? The simplest toys are the best. I would say the toys that you can destroy with impunity are the best. That's probably more dog-like. Possibly. But dogs like balls. I guess oh, yeah, they but they like to tear balls. them apart. Give them, give them a soft rubber one one time and see how long it lasts. That's it'll, true. It'll be gone in a day. It, it may be a compulsion to them to destroy things. Yeah, kind of that pull the, pull the flesh from the bone kind of instinct. I remember one of my dogs had this little 
miniature basketball, seven inches in diameter, that we gave to him. And he tried like crazy to get his teeth into it. He'd run it around the house and finally just give up and throw his head back and bark in frustration. <laughs> just bark his head off. It drove him crazy. He never quite did get the hang of it. Well, I was interested to find out that somebody had done rigorous work on this topic. The list is growing, too. There's apparently more scholars who are going to be looking into this. I think that it's an important thing because it really does teach us. I mean, we're we're kind of making a silly list here in some ways, and, of course, there's all kinds of books out there on the market now that, you know, the hundred things that my dog taught me or the posters that I've seen, too. But it seems to me that um, that the illusion that we live somewhere that is away from nature is sort of uh, reinforced by addressing sociology as if the only interactions that we have are between human beings. The truth of the matter is we live with animals. We live on a planet and we interact with animals all the time. I mean, it would be interesting to do the sociology of bugs, for instance, because... (laughs) They're everywhere. Yes, and we interact. And they're with organized. Them. <laughs> they're organized. <laughs> well, we certainly there's a lot of warfare talk around bugs. <laughs> but the bottom line, I guess, is that nature interacts with people, and if you're interested in interaction effects, you have to look at that. Some of the nature even gets into your house, um, eats all your food, tears up your newspapers, sleeps on your bed, and brings toys with him when he comes. <laughs> Before we go today, we'd like to wish Dave Thomas in Tampa, Florida, a happy 35th birthday. When you get here, we will celebrate. We'd like to thank the Dogs of Dallas Road for their help with today's show, Princess and Alexis, the Great Danes, Morgan, Dexter, Tash, and Brandon. Today's show is dedicated to the wonderful pets and animals that have made our lives rich. Those who are no longer with us, Otto, Charlie, Ketchup, Kitty Wurz, George, Skippy, Ginger, Rover the Cat, Baby, Joey, Tabitha and Tyler, Blitz, Dylan, Puffin, Mischief, and Bubba. Those that we never named, and Billy Bob, who is far away in North Carolina, and of course, our most special friend of all, Anna Vim, who continues to make our lives sweeter every day and lets us live in her house. Join us here next week at noon on CFUV. You have been listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria, British Columbia, simulcasted on 104.3 cable and cfuv.uvic.ca. First Person Plural is produced weekly by Dr. Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson. Music for First Person Plural is composed, performed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson. For more information about First Person Plural or Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson, visit our website, culturalconstructioncompany.com.
Can you bark? Yeah. You gonna bark? Can you speak? Brandon, sing! Come on. Well, he won't sing with the ball in his mouth. Brandon, sing. Come on. Brandon, come on. You're a good singer. Come here. Here. Okay. Oh, okay. Go. Go. Come on, sing. Where is it? Soprano. Okay. 